Hello, and welcome to episode 15 of Arbiter of Worlds. If you're new to the channel, this episode is part of a series on the art and science of designing and running tabletop RPGs. If that appeals to you, please click the like and subscribe button so you can join our community. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks for supporting the channel. Now, I've said before that every game master is a game designer every time he issues a game ruling. And in the weeks ahead, as I prepare for the launch of my upcoming Adventurer Conqueror King System Imperial Imprint, which is the second edition of Axe, this channel is going to be zooming in a bit on game design. Today, we're going to discuss the concept of incentives as it relates to tabletop RPG players. But first, a little backstory. Years ago, when I was running The Escapist in the Triangle Game Initiative, I had the pleasure of lunch with Mr. John Zur Platten. John is the writing partner of Flint Dilly, Gary Gygax's old friend and collaborator. And through Flint, John had had the chance to learn a lot about Gary Gygax and the origins of Dungeons and Dragons. John explained to me that, quote, to understand D&D, you have to understand that Gary thought like an insurance actuary. D&D is fantasy fiction through actuarial science. Now, go back, reread the first edition Dungeon Master's Guide, and the truth of this claim becomes obvious. Previously bizarre rules like the disease tables or potion mixing suddenly click. Gary wrote those rules because he wanted to account for the actuarial risk of living in a fantasy world. Gygaxian naturalism is simply an extension of this. Now, unlike Gary, we've had the benefit of enormously powerful spreadsheets, computer modeling, random generators at our desktop. Seeing how useful those tools have been for me leaves me in awe of the designers who could develop the engines for D&D without them. And reflecting on the actuarial science behind early Dungeons and Dragons led me to think about what fields lie behind my own design philosophy. Some of you know, uh, my training is as an attorney. I graduated Harvard Law School magna cum laude way back in Y2K. And at HLS, I studied a jurisprudential approach called law and economics. As taught in law school, law and economics is the application of economic principles to the analysis of legal rules. Now, there are several different jurisprudential approaches that lawyers and judges take. Legal formalism analyzes law based on moral and cultural premises that serve as kind of an axiomatic groundwork. Critical legal studies analyzes law based on relationships to postmodern power structures. Law and economics analyzes law to look at what it does to human economic behavior. Law and economics assumes that people are generally utility maximizing and generally respond rationally to incentives. Law and economics as applied to RPGs has been incredibly helpful to me as a designer and as a game master in evaluating rules for their effect over the course of a campaign. If players are treated as utility maximizing, rational and incentive reactive, then many game rules which seem like good ideas are revealed to actually be bad ideas. A great example is shields must be splintered, which was for a long time the darling rule of the old school Renaissance. Everyone thought it was oh so clever. And shields must be splintered was a rule that allowed a character to avoid a killing blow by sacrificing a shield. And the idea was to add increased utility to shields, to give low-level characters an opportunity to survive despite their low hit points. It felt historically plausible as shields did break in battle, but it also had a story game element that gave players dramatic choice in play. I deliberately excluded this rule from my own game axe from day one. Why? Law and economics. Let's consider a seventh level fighter with a bag of holding. A bag of holding can carry approximately 1,000 shields. Now the fighter is invincible if shields must be splintered. All he needs to do is reach into his bag and voila, he produces a one charge item that prevents death. And if a bag of holding isn't available, some zeroth level shield bearers can carry quite enough shields. Shields must be splintered, in other words, only works as a rule so long as the players don't rationally react to the fact that a cheap, widely available 10 gold piece item has become a one charge magic item that prevents death. As soon as the players realize this and they have the resources that shields and shield bearers are negligible expenses, it breaks the game. Law and economics also explains why so many of the post D&D RPGs defaulted to GM as storyteller railroads 
regardless of any other mechanics that they put in play. All of those RPGs decided to get rid of the silliness of Dungeons & Dragons XP for Gold model, and instead they relied on subjective XP rewards from the GM. And that's everything from D6 Star Wars RPG to Shadowrun to Second Edition D&D to Vampire the Masquerade. They all went down this path. But if the XP award is a subjective award from the GM, that means that the rational, utility-maximizing player just seeks to maximize the GM's subjective approval of his play. And what does that lead to? It leads to a sort of soft fascism of what does the GM want us to do? Right? It leads to players who compete for the GM's attention and favor. It destroys player agency. It creates railroads even when the GM doesn't want a railroad. Subjective award systems, I believe, are one of the worst developments to ever occur in the history of RPG design. Ironically, the generation of games developed after the post-D&D uh, 90s era kept the subjective rewards. But then they bent over backwards to limit the GM's power in other ways, not understanding that it was the power to reward that gave the power to control. The game rules should be what reward the players, not the GM. Now, this is why both of my games, Axe and Ascendant, have carefully chosen strictly objective XP awards. Axe is a game about rising from a nobody to a somebody, and the XP awards align with those goals. No GM intervention required. Ascendant is a game about saving the day from supervillains, and the XP awards align with those goals. No GM subjectivity involved. A third example of the application of law and economics thinking is in domain rules. In Axe, adventurers who establish a domain can make profits from the domain, and in making profits, they can earn experience points to advance their character. Now, contrast this to the Menser Companion or Rules Cyclopedia, which sharply and purposefully limited the XP gain from domains, and worse, it made the domains inherently unprofitable. According to Frank Menser, the designer, this was on purpose in order to force the characters to keep adventuring. But players don't need incentives to keep adventuring in D&D, because the adventuring already yields gold, magic items, and XP, which are the three main incentives of the game. What players need, if domains are desired, are incentives to build and run domains. And this lack of reward structure for domain management, and indeed for downtime play in general, has been one of the main reasons that domains have been the province of retirement rather than action in most fantasy RPGs. So my games may not be to everyone's taste, but one thing I am confident of is that they are among the best designed RPGs from the point of view of connecting the rules of the game, its laws, with the incentives of the players, the economics. Now, how can you as a game master running an open world RPG campaign put this approach to use in your own campaign? Well, one of the common criticisms of the agency-centered sandbox approach to game mastering is that it places this impossible burden on the GM because you have to be prepared for the players to do absolutely anything at any time. I recommend that you prepare for what you expect the players to do, but a lot of GMs then assert that players are totally unpredictable. They're not. They're not if you use an objective reward system like XP for gold, because the players will generally respond to incentives and you can generally predict their behavior simply by evaluating their set of choices from their point of view of reward maximizers. Now this doesn't work if you're using a subjective reward system. In a subjective reward system, your players are incentivized to do what they think you want them to do. Now you, on the other hand, want them to make free agentic choices, but that doesn't help you plan, does it? So now you're trying to imagine what they think you think they should do. But players aren't dumb and they can figure out you're doing that. So now they're trying to imagine what you think they think you think they should do and so on. I hope that's been a useful overview for you of law and economics as applied to game design and game mastering. Tune in next week for another deep delve into the art and science of designing and running RPGs. Before you go, please hit the like and subscribe buttons and tell your friends about Arbiter of Worlds. Thank you.